In the past, I mentioned in passing that my first console was a Sega Master System, Sega's foray into the 8-bit generation. I really think that it's kind of underrated due to the sheer predominance of the NES and its place in the popular culture. It had some really good games on it, like the one we're going to be discussing today. And I choose to start here because every time I see someone go to make a video about the series, this game tends to just get kind of overlooked, skipped. It's sometimes just treated like a stepping stone so they can just talk about PSO2 and PSO3. And yes, I know they want to call it New Genesis, but it's PSO3. They just kept it under the PSO2 label for legalese with licenses they have to work with. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. But today, I'm going to look at the grandfather of those games. Join me for a closer look at Fantasy Star. Greetings, everyone. This is the Hipster Snack, here to go back to the same year, and same week even, as the release of the original Final Fantasy. That's right, the original Fantasy Star came out just two days after the Japanese release of the very first Final Fantasy on the Famicom. Now, I'm not really here to compare them, that'd be apples to oranges at best anyway, but the rivalry was set right out of the gates. Headed by Reiko Kodama and Yuji Naka, two of the driving forces behind the team that would soon be making Sonic the Hedgehog a few short years later. And for the sake of today's video, I'll actually be using footage from the original Master System version, and not its many innumerable ports. So I hope you're nostalgic for that 4x3 aspect ratio. Speaking of technical limitations, the cartridge housed a battery backup, which was extremely rare for a Master System game, and was 4 megabits, which was positively huge for that era. Interestingly enough, this contributed to a high sales price when it was first released, but that's not the only interesting and distinct thing about this console RPG. For starters, the setting is in space, a hybrid sci-fi high fantasy setting more akin to Star Wars than D&D, unlike many of its contemporaries. The story takes place in the Algol star system across its three planets, Palma, frequently called Parma throughout the game, which just made me have sudden cravings for Parmesan cheese, the desert planet, Motavia, and the ice planet, Dezorus. The story opens on Palma, when we learn the once benign ruler Lassic has become a crazed, tyrannical despot, and in a slew of recent offenses kills a young rebel named Nero, who happens to be brother to the main character, Alice. Alice takes up arms against Lassic, and swears revenge for her fallen brother. And yes, this is one of those RPGs where the character identities and motivations are established out of the gate, rather than via player input. I know it boils down to taste preference, ultimately, I just find it really interesting that that's how they decided to do it rather than letting you custom make your own party, which was more the norm at the time. Alice, after a series of events that required me to look up a walkthrough to eventually figure out, eventually goes to Matavia and rescues the cat-like creature, Meow, who offers her a medicine to cure local legend Odin from Medusa's Curse of Stone. And yes, Medusa's in the game, don't ask me why, I don't know. And after saving Odin, he joins your party as well as your beefy muscle type. After a while of me getting lost and referencing the guide again, I recruited Noah the Sage who rounds out the party. Alice ends up being something of the party's ace in the hole, given there is literally no way she won't be the highest level in the party, and since she gains both healing and offensive magic, she'll never not be useful. Meow can only equip certain specific gear, and the game doesn't do a good job making clear what is and isn't exclusively his, so he ends up kind of being the tag-along of the party up until he learns Cure. Odin starts off pathetically weak for a guy named after the Norse Allfather, but grows into his own when you learn that he can use most of the same gear as Alice, and he can focus on busting heads. And Noah, Lutz in the Japanese, will gain a wide variety of spells, meaning if you can get out from the bottom of the dungeon you recruit him in, he'll grow into his own soon enough. Graphically, this game is outstanding, particularly considering that this was 1987. The Master System was an undervalued little gem when it came to graphical fidelity, and this colorful, smoothly animated game is proof of that much. I was legit surprised when a combination of interesting and clever animation tricks are used throughout in order to give this game a smooth, cohesive feel, like a fishman monster who can attack using its tongue, which has an animated sprite for the attack that overlays the static sprite so seamlessly that it caught me completely off guard when I first saw it move. And then there's these cinematic cutscene moments which remind me of the animatics in Ninja Gaiden whenever you recruit a party member. It's all just masterfully done. 
And the dungeons being done in vector-style 3D dungeon crawling experience was just excellently done, and a way to capitalize on system resources, or lack thereof to be more accurate. Fun fact, while in a dungeon there is no transition between moving to the dungeon and entering into a battle, as battles are already done in that Dragon Quest-esque first-person mode. And since turning counts as a movement within the dungeon, I was repeatedly startled when I went from safe to turning just one step and suddenly being engaged in combat. That seamless blend of exploration and action moments was one of the things that made the dungeon crawl so viscerally exciting, even if I required a guide and some graph paper at times. On the audio side, the game tells a similar story. Within just a short time of playing, I caught myself humming the overworld ditty along with the game at times. Sound effects are very arcadey and retro in their style, but I like that. It totally works, especially given the sci-fi dressing. The only thing that was annoying were these eyeball bat enemies that had a whiny, high-pitched sound indicating their attack. I could really do without that. But since that's the worst complaint I can even muster, the overall audio experience is quite good. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And from a gameplay experience, it's an early JRPG with some dungeon crawling elements and everything that that entails, the good and bad alike. Starting from the top, the game is absolutely designed to stop you from beating it in a weekend long rental period. While you can save anywhere anytime you're not in a battle and you have five glorious save spots with which you can even name, you will not get outside the castle caves without having some trouble from the local fauna. Even if you explore the first town, confusingly split into two halves by the spaceport, you find the free cache of cash given to you to buy the first shield in the game with, you will still get mauled by the local giant insect population unless you seriously take your time in progressing. You will need to grind. A lot. Both for your levels, which will come slow, and for gear, which are really the things that will put Pep in Alice's step in the early hours of gameplay. For context, my first experiences of the game included the aforementioned first shield in the game, and foolishly assuming I was good to go. I spoke with some NPCs in town, one of whom mentioned a man named Odin, the man my late brother instructed me to find in the wake of his passing, and another who mentioned that he and a strange animal had been seen in the town of Sion. After a little pressing, I learned that Sion was a town east and a little north of my bustling town, so I assumed that the game would have no issues with me strolling over to Sion to look for Odin. Oh, how wrong I was, as I was suddenly beset by two owlbears, which were neither owl nor bear, but rather eyeballs being held up by bat wings and animated through sheer force of hatred for level 1 adventurers. I was then bludgeoned to a very undignified death and forced to start over again. This time, however, taking my time to grind out the giant grasshoppers. It's vital to note that the work yield ratio for any given monster encounter is essentially random, and with early game monsters, it's actually the scorpions who are the best targets to encounter in early fights, proportionate to the XP and Masetta, this game's currency, that they drop. Compounding some early frustrations further, this game also takes a shortcut commonly seen in Dragon Quest games that I lack the words to articulate the depth of my hatred for, where groups of enemies that are of the same species will be put into groups, and while you can tell it to attack whatever group you'd like, you cannot specify which member of the group needs to be targeted, and thus your characters guess at random. I've actually been told that this is a leftover from the era of AD&D, but what this translates to is mechanical frustration for the player, courtesy of being unable to cope with multiplication of force via sheer numbers. And since when you get more party members, the average number of monsters per encounter tends to go up, this problem multiplies in more ways than one. Now, I want to take a moment here to stress, I do not hate the game for these faults, but they are real faults that need to be considered, and they were conventions of the time, and those conventions have since been replaced with other superior options. The simple truth is you will need to grind if you're okay with that, and you'll find a satisfying, if fairly simple, RPG mechanical experience with a relatively low maximum level cap of, I believe, 30, so the grinding out to pad out runtime really only bloats your first couple of hours and not the better length of the game. Now, that said, what I'm a little less forgiving of is the issue I encountered next. The game does a very poor job telling you what you need to do. Getting Meow to join the party is mandatory to move the story forward, but the method required to do so reads like something you do to unlock a secret character in a more modern game, and that's just the start of the story, essentially. Now, if you tried every option available to you and spoke to every NPC, you would eventually brute force it and deduce the method that they expect of you, and you might even have the benefit of grinding up some extra spending money in the downtime for having done so. 
but it actually gets more frustrating without a guide because I ran into a situation a few hours in where I had no idea what I was to do next. I could only move between Palma and Motavia, and the NPC hive mind was indicating I needed an audience with the governor on the latter world, and that he had a taste for sweets. I checked all the shops, spoke with the NPCs, explored around using Odin's compass to access a new and completely useless town. I was kind of at a loss for what the game wanted me to do. Eventually, my willpower and my pride crumble, and I reference a guide who tells me that north of Scion there's a path you can take. It doesn't even look like there is, courtesy of the boulders that are in your way, but you actually can. There, you enter a cave dungeon and descend to the very bottom, whereupon you'll meet a man who apologizes for setting up a shop in the bottom of the dungeon and sells you shortcakes. As an aside, for some strange reason, he tells you they cost 1,000 meseta, but then he'll only end up charging you like 200 some for it, but whatever. That's the item I needed to continue the game, and for the life of me, I had no idea it was even there or how to access it. The game does a poor job conveying to the player a lot of necessary information for the sake of actually progressing. Now, what the game does well, it does with the best of them. The battle speed is refreshingly brisk, moving at a pace basically as fast as you can press the buttons, and the cutscenes, like the spaceship that flies between worlds, can be skipped with the push of a button. And in many ways, this is actually quite ahead of its time in terms of quality of life improvements. And, the likely unintended side consequence of grouping enemies into bundles and the fact that only one enemy species can be present in any given fight, is that your attacks never miss because you're target an enemy that was knocked out a step or two earlier in the rotation, something that even Final Fantasy took a few iterations to correct. I'm not saying it's a flawless masterpiece, it certainly isn't, but Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System was an interesting and innovative game that helped set the stage for expectations players would have for RPGs for many years to come. Despite owning the console, I didn't actually grow up with this title. I admit I was already spoiled by better designed games that came with the benefit of that hindsight and the stronger hardware behind them. So for what the game rightfully is, Fantasy Star is an amazing and oft-overlooked gem on an oft-overlooked platform. And with how many re-releases it's been given and the abundance of maps and guides available online for people who want the ease of the burden of accessibility, it's definitely a game you owe it to yourself to pick up and play. That's my final word in this obscure game, a very deeply flawed game that I can't stop playing. This has been the Fantasy Snack. Yes, the unnecessary PH and everything. And thanks for watching. If you liked today's video, hit the like button so I know. Tap the subscribe button for more like this every week. And drop a comment down below telling me if this was the first game of the series you ever played. Which installment got you into Fantasy Star? For me, that was Fantasy Star 4, and don't worry, we'll get to it at some point. Join me here each week for more Let's Plays, Obscure Reviews, Snack Tech, and the new home of the Tomodachi Bros Review Podcast, and I will see you there.